So you have a maths test coming up. And in preparation for this, over the last few weeks, you have been effortfully encoding all the information pertaining to formulas, theorems, concepts, etc. What is the one cognitive faculty that will allow you to use this encoded information on the day of the test? It is the faculty of memory storage. Hello and welcome everyone to the third video in the memory series wherein we learn about the concept of memory storage. You can find the list of all the videos that we plan to cover in this particular series down in the description box below as well as pinned to the comment section. We already covered two videos in this series. In the first video, we gave an introduction to this topic and defined what is memory, as well as looked at an overview of the three key stages that are included in the stages of memory formation. In the second video, we covered the information pertaining to the first stage of memory formation, which is encoding. We highly recommend that you watch these two videos before you proceed with the current video in order to pursue the study of memory in a logical manner. You can find the link of these videos in the description box below as well as pinned to the comment section or by clicking the i button on the top right corner of your screen. However, if you already know these topics and are well versed with the definition of what is a memory and know the concept of encoding as well as the different types of encoding, then feel free to pursue with the current video. With that said, let's move on to looking at what we cover in today's video. We start this video by defining the concept of memory storage. We then move on to learning about the putative Atkinson and Chiffrin multi-storage model of memory storage. In that, we cover the different stages of Atkinson and Chiffrin storage model, which include the sensory memory, the short-term memory, and the long-term memory. We then move on to looking at the evidence for multi-storage model and finally end the video by critically evaluating the multi-storage model. With that said, let's proceed to the video. As we learned in the previous videos in this series, memory formation includes three different stages. Storage is the second stage in this process. So let's start by asking the question, what is memory storage? Memory storage can be visualized as a storage space, such as this box, which we can see is overlaid on the schematic of a brain, which stores the information that has been encoded and uploads the same in the storage space. More formally, we can define memory storage as the act and the process of storing effortfully encoded information in the brain with an aim to create a more permanent record of it for retrieving it or recalling it at a later stage. Now that we have the understanding of what memory storage is and know its definition, let's understand the stages of memory storage with the putative Atkinson and Schifrin's multi-storage memory model. Richard Atkinson and Richard Schifrin proposed that the purpose of the cognitive ability of memory storage, as we reviewed in the definition, is to store previously encoded information in order to supply us with this information at a later time in the future. In 1968, they proposed the structural model or the modal model of memory storage referred to as the multi-store model of memory storage with an aim to explain how the effortfully encoded information is stored in the human memory for serving the very purpose of providing it at a later time. The multi-store model was proposed in the 1960s, an era in cognitive psychology wherein Cognitive psychologists explain human cognition by drawing parallels between the functionality of computers and human brains. In light of the influence of this approach during this era, Atkinson and Schifrin also drew parallels between the information processing and memory storage occurring in computers with the information processing and memory storage occurring in human brains and posited that the effortfully encoded information passes through various distinct stages and is subject to specific control processes before being fully consolidated 
in the memory storage for later retrieval or recall. Specifically, Atkinson and Schifrin model proposed that the encoded information passes through three distinct stages and three different types of control processes in this process. The three distinct stages that this model proposed are sensory memory, short-term memory, and finally, the long-term memory. Moving on, let's dive a little deeper into this model and understand how the encoded information passes through the three distinct stages of memory storage and how it is augmented by the control processes with the help of a box and arrow styled multi-store model schematic. So according to this model schematic and this model, the process of memory storage begins when we firstly come across the information from outer environmental stimuli and we perceive and encode this information via our sensory routes. This recently perceived and encoded information then directly reaches the first stage in the multi-store model, which is the sensory memory stage. Now, before proceeding to understanding what each of these units are, note that the multi-store model proposes a number of control processes. Now, control processes are a set of intermediate cognitive processes that govern and facilitate how successfully the information is transferred from one unit of the model to another unit. In this model schematic, we highlight the control processes in yellow in order to help you distinguish it from the memory units themselves. Moving on, according to this model, it is crucial to pay active attention to the information in the sensory memory register for it to proceed to the next storage unit, which is the short-term memory. In this information storage stage, the cognitive process of attention is the control process exercised. It is the first control process introduced in the multi-store model and its chief function is to facilitate the transfer of encoded information from the sensory stage to the STM or the short-term memory. Note that any encoded information at the sensory memory stage that is not subjected to active attention is often lost and does not therefore transfer to the next stage of short-term memory. Following this, the model proceeds to the next storage unit, which is the short-term memory or the STM stage. Now, the capacity of the STM is low due to which the information in this stage is only held for a short period of time. This characteristic is where this unit gets its name from. Now, because of the short-term nature of this memory storage unit, it is key that the information in STM is subject to the next control process, which is active rehearsal. Now, active rehearsal allows the information in the short-term memory to be active and maintains it there. There are various ways in which rehearsal might occur. One common example is repetition of information verbally, such as when you're trying to remember, say, a four-digit code by repeating it constantly verbally till you get that piece of information written down on a paper or consolidated. This brings us to the next function of the control process of rehearsal, which is to maintain the information in the STM long enough so that it can be transferred into the long-term memory storage unit. Now, this continuous process of maintaining the incoming encoded information from the sensory unit to the STM and holding it long enough in the STM to transfer it to the LTM is subject to the rehearsal loop process, which is simply going back and forth with the control process of rehearsal in order to transfer the information from one stage to the other. Now the final control process of this model is retrieval. Retrieval essentially is the cognitive process which allows bringing back the information from the long-term memory to the short-term memory as and when we want to use it. Now also note that retrieval is a separate stage in the 
stages of memory formation and that we will cover this topic in great detail in an upcoming video. But for now, we know that retrieval is a control process in the multi-store model wherein it allows the retrieval or recall of information from the long-term memory to the short-term memory as and when we require it. All right, so let's look at an interim summary of the model so far. So according to the Atkinson and Schifrin model, the information passes via three stages, which include the sensory memory stage, the short-term memory stage or STM, and the long-term memory stage or the LTM. They are all separate locations in which the information is stored. As per the model schematic, information transfer from one stage to the other stage occurs in a linear and sequential process. In this model, STM serves as the gateway by which the information can gain access to the LTM and the various memory stores operate in conjunction with the permanent LTM store via the process of attention, rehearsal and retrieval. Let's now move on to the next section wherein we will briefly look at each of these three stages. Now note that diving deep into each of the units of sensory memory STM and LTM is beyond the scope of the current video because dedicated videos on each of these topics will be released in the upcoming videos. However, let's build a working understanding of each of these units as a preparation for the upcoming videos. The first stage is the sensory input stage, also referred to as sensory memory. The sensory memory refers to a brief memory storage unit in which the incoming information that enters our cognition via sensory portals, for example vision, is momentarily stored until it is passed to the next storage space which according to the Atkinson and Schifrin model would be the short term memory storage space. Let's look at an example to understand sensory memory better. Imagine you're crossing a road and for that you look at the traffic lights at the time. In doing so, what you do is briefly register the color of the traffic light in order to discern the appropriate action of either crossing the road or not, which you can recall from your already stored information from the past in the LTM. Now, the capacity of this particular unit is accounting for all sensory experiences and the duration or the amount of time information is retained in this unit is very small, ranging from about one fourth to half a second. It is because of this short duration that paying undivided attention to the information at this stage is crucial for it to pass to the next stage. Finally, the encoding of information in this unit of memory is sense-specific. Moving on, the next stage refers to the short-term memory stage, also called as the STM for short. Now, the STM has been referred to as the shorter temporary storage unit, which receives its inputs from either the sensory memory or from the LTM via retrieval. The STM acts as a gateway to transferring information to the LTM as well. In terms of the capacity, the STM has a limited capacity and can hold up to plus or minus seven items, that is ranging from about nine to five items. Holding up to seven items is the average capacity of our STM. The now it holds these plus or minus seven items for approximately 20 seconds, which is much longer of a duration as compared to the sensory memory. And the encoding in STM is usually auditory in nature. Recall from our previous video on encoding, there are six types of memory encoding and auditory encoding is one out of them. An example of STM would be you trying to remember and store the information of your friend's phone number. Now, 20 seconds of duration is also enough time for you to repeatedly rehearse this information in order to then transfer this information to the next and the final memory storage stage, which is LTM or long-term memory. Now, LTM is being referred to as a more permanent storage unit 
in which the incoming information from the STM is stored and consolidated in a permanent storage from which it can be retrieved or recalled as and when we need it in the future. Unlike the STM, the LTM is a continuous information storage system and it has unlimited capacity as well. Encoding in LTM is mainly semantic in nature, but auditory and visual encoding is also undertaken. An example of LTM can be during an exam when you recall and retrieve the information on the test material from your LTM. All right. So that was a brief review of each of the units in the multi-store memory model. Let's now move on to looking at some evidence that supports the existence of these distinct storage units. Evidence for the existence of the distinct stores of memory comes from studies with patients who have suffered from brain damage. These studies have shown that patients with bilateral damage to the hippocampal region had nearly no abilities to form new long-term memories, but their STM capacities remained intact. Famous cases such as those of Henry Melison, famously known as HM, who underwent severe bilateral medial temporal lobectomy, which led to removal of most of his hippocampal region, was a good example of this wherein his STM capacities remained intact while some specific types of the LTM were damaged. Furthermore, evidence from experimental studies undertaken with healthy participants with intact cognition have supported the existence of distinct memory stores. For example, a study by Glasner and Kunitz undertaken in 1966 showed that when participants are presented with a list of words, they tend to remember the first few and the last few words more as compared to those in the middle of the list. These results supported the existence of the separate LTM and STM stores, the explanation being that the words early on in the list were put into the LTM because participants had the time to undertake rehearsal for transfer of information to LTM, while the words in the end went into the STM as they had the time to simultaneously and actively rehearse for maintenance in the STM. Let's now move on to the last part of the video wherein we critically analyze and evaluate the multi-store model by looking at its strengths and weaknesses. Now, although previously the idea of different memory stores had been proposed by psychologists such as William James, this idea had not been developed further and was only brought into fruition with the Atkinson and Schifrin model in the 1960s. Although later evidences supporting the Atkinson and Schifrin model did find fundamental differences between the propositions of memory stores by William James and Atkinson and Schifrin. Furthermore, in relation to the previous strength, we can state that this was the first structural model that clearly described each memory stage and has been instrumental to drive further research within each type of memory storage unit, which over the years has also allowed to refine this current model as well. Finally, this model has been supported by evidence from both experimental studies with healthy population as well as from clinical brain damaged population wherein the existence of different memory stores has been found. In terms of the weaknesses, this model has been referred to be an oversimplified, linear, passive, one-way model that fails to capture the complexity of information passage during the process of memory storage. Specifically, the model suggestion pertaining to the existence of both long and short-term memory operating as two single units in a uniform fashion has been called out as a key weakness, since we now have evidence that this is not the case. Furthermore, one of the early criticisms of the model pertain to the tripartite format of the model. This was specifically targeted at the inclusion of the sensory unit as a separate unit. 
Parsimoniously speaking, the sensory memory acts as a control process like rehearsal, attention and retrieval, acting as a sensory register instead of a distinct structure as proposed by the original model. Later revisions of this model address these claims and incorporated sensory register with the short-term store instead of including sensory memory as a separate unit altogether. Additionally, it has now become apparent that both short-term and long-term memory are way more complicated than it was previously perceived and explained by this model. Short-term memory, for example, is more than just a unitary store. The working memory model proposed by Badley and Hitch in 1974 proved this by showing that short-term memory is more than just one simple unitary store and comprises different components, for example, central executive, visual spatial sketchpad, auditory loop, etc. In the case of long-term memory, it is unlikely that Different kinds of knowledge, such as remembering how to play a computer game, the rules of subtraction and addition, and remembering what we did yesterday are all stored within a single long-term memory store. Indeed, different types of long-term memory have been identified, such as episodic memory, procedural memory, semantic memory, etc. All topics that we will cover in the further videos in this series. Furthermore, the model has been criticized as suggesting rehearsal as the key control process which initiates and facilitates transfer of information into the LTM. There is very little evidence supporting this hypothesis and long-term recall can in fact be better predicted by other frameworks in which items which are encoded at a more deeper semantic level are shown to have stronger traces in the long-term memory. That is, information subjected to deeper elaborative processes have a better chance of entering the long-term memory as opposed to those that are subject to shallower simplistic rehearsal processes, as suggested by this model. All right, so that is the end of today's video on memory storage and the multi-store model proposed by Atkinson and Schifrin. Thank you for watching and thank you for your attention. If you found value in today's video and want to follow through the entire memory series as well as other upcoming videos on cognitive psychology, neuroscience, psychology in general and research methods used in these fields, please make sure to subscribe to our channel Brain Cyclopedia. Also, like this video, send us a comment and share this video with someone you think will benefit. Do not forget to press the bell icon as it will help you stay updated with all the recent uploads in this channel. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media sites on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can find the link of all of these platforms pinned to the comment section below on the channel banner as well as in the description. See you in our next video.